Hi there. In this series of short tutorials, I'm going to cover the very basics of animating with Blender. For the time being, the tutorials are going to be in Blender 2.79, but most of what I'm showing will be applicable in Blender 2.8 as well. So to begin with, you can see I've got a very basic scene here. I've got a simple plane and three objects. And let's work out a way to animate this scene, to add some movement to it. So I'm going to right click, it's right click because it's Blender 2.79, on the sphere over here, the yellow sphere. And let's say I want to move it from this place to this place and I want to animate it. Now the first thing to be aware of with animation is that it's obviously not a smooth movement the way movement in real life appears to be. It's actually what we're seeing and what you're looking at now in fact is a sequence of still frames displayed quickly enough that it appears to be movement. So for example, if this was to appear here, then here, 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 and here, over the course of say, half a second, we would pretty much interpret that as a movement. And if I move it quickly because of the update rate of your monitor and the system I'm using to record this video, that's pretty much exactly what's happening. You're seeing still frames. You may actually see it a little bit there. But even so, we don't necessarily want to have to do what a physical world animator would have to do, and that is, take a photograph there, as it were, take another one there, take another picture there, and so on. We don't want to have to animate that way. You can animate that way. You can certainly render each scene, move something around, render that. But for most things, there's no reason to do it that way. In fact, I really can't think why you would want to do that way at all in a computer animating scenario. So we first of all need to determine over what time our animation is going to take place. Now, by default, Blender assumes that you're going to make an animation that's 250 frames long. So the default setup will show you the timeline at the bottom here, and you can see it starts at zero and goes to 250. So that's 250 frames. Exactly how long that lasts depends on your frame rate. So in other words, how many frames per second you're going to display. We click this little camera icon here under dimensions. Don't worry too much about all the complication in there. Just accept the defaults to begin with but there's frame rate. So that's currently set to the default of 25 frames per second. So obviously 250 frames is 10 seconds. So if I move this over the course of 25 frames from here to here, it's going to take one second once I've properly animated it. Or if it takes 250 frames, it's gonna take 10 seconds. So that's something worth bearing in mind when you're animating. We very often end up having to tweak things a little bit anyway in order to get the speed of movement and so on that we want. But it's worth keeping it in mind and then you'll soon get a general feel for how far to move an object in a given time. Now, as I was saying, we don't want to have to place it in these different positions. So fortunately, Blender will do something called tweening for us, which is basically saying, well, on frame zero or one, the object was there. And on frame 25, it was there. So I know that for every frame in between, it must be moving a certain amount, and I'll get into exactly how much in a moment, between each frame and the next. And so it, that's exactly what it does. It moves that object before it renders it. So how can we make this object move? So let's go to the first frame to begin with. I've got that object selected. I can either use these arrows here or I can press G to move it around. And with the object selected and my mouse pointer hovering over it, I'm just going to press I. And you can see I can select a number of different options. This is insert keyframe. So I'm just going to select location at the moment. And if I move the timeline, you can see there's a little yellow line appeared there, which tells me for the object I have selected, there is now a keyframe. In other words, a keyframe, a frame that specifies something important. In this case, the location of that object. So what if I go back to the beginning and I move this object, perhaps where I want it to go, but I've done nothing else. And now I move where my little green pointer, which is pointing to the frame we're looking at, to somewhere else. You notice it just jumped back. And the reason for that is because there is one keyframe in this timeline at the moment for that object. And that keyframe is for there. No matter what I do with the object, as soon as the timeline moves, it will jump back to there. Effectively, Blender's interpolated all the frames as there because there's no other keyframes. So let's zoom in on this. And in fact, I'm just gonna limit the timeline to 25 frames at the moment. So just using the middle mouse button just to zoom in so we can see our frames a little better down here now. And by the way, you can see what I'm doing when I click the mouse button or hold shift or anything like that down here. So I've keyframed this position 
So let's go to the last frame, which is frame 25. Now I'm going to move this object after I've moved the timeline pointer and I'm going to put it there. And before I do anything else, I'm going to press I and say location. So you'll now see I've got two yellow lines here and you'll notice I selected a frame somewhere in the middle and my object didn't go to the start and didn't go to the end. It went somewhere between. So if I go to the beginning and press play now, you can see it goes from the right to the left. So it is animated. So I'm going to go back to 250 frames now, but I'm going to go to frame 25 by just typing 25 there. With the object selected, I'm going to press Alt I and that allows me to delete that keyframe. So we now know if I bring the end frame in view again. When I press play, it'll jump back there again. So I'm going to go to the end again, move my object to there once more and press I. So this time I'm saying the same approximate movement but I'm doing it over 250 frames, so that should take 10 seconds. So here we go, I press play, and you notice there's our object, and it looks nice and smooth, and it rushes across there, and then slows down. Now, very often, when you're representing some kind of physical movement, that's quite a good way to move an object. I'm gonna to go to something a little bit technical next, but it's worth knowing, and it's not too complicated. Basically, this object is not moving in a simple linear fashion. What it's doing is it's starting off slow, it's speeding up around the middle, it's traveling the fastest around where it's going through that blue cube, and then it starts to slow down until it gets to here. So it's a Bezier function. So I'm going to drag this little chevron in the corner down a little bit, and I'm going to change to the graph editor. Still got my object here selected. If I open this up, you can see this is showing, because I've got this object selected, the X, Y and Z location for my object. Now, Y and Z are not changing, so they're just flat lines. But X is the one that's changing. And if I zoom out a little bit, you can see it's over 250 frames. We just happen to be at frame 239 at the moment. And if I go to the beginning and press play, you can see the slope on that line increases to be the steepest about the middle, and then eases off again as it gets over here. So basically the interpolation or tweening that's happening, it's using a Bezier curve function to give us a sort of smooth acceleration and then deceleration. And for many movements, that is what you want to use. However, we often don't want that. We often want a much simpler movement. So we can go to key here with the object selected, interpolation mode, and we can select linear. Bezier there is the default. But if we go to linear, and I'll go back to the beginning of the animation. You notice that is now a straight line. If I press play, you can see it's a constant speed all the way along. There's no variation in speed. It's, it, it's moving at a given speed until it reaches its destination and then it stops, or in fact goes back to the beginning. There are other interpolation modes while we're here. So constant if we put that on. So you can see, in fact, the X position doesn't change until right at the end and then suddenly it does. So I'll just move it quickly onward. You'll see it suddenly goes to the end and then goes back again because our animation is wrapping around. You probably won't use that one very often. And then we've got some other options here. So for example, if we come up to dynamic effects, there's some quite interesting ones. So if we select back, for example, I press that one, it goes a little quicker and then it slows down and then it sort of overshoots and comes back. So you often use that one for some sort of realistic effects. If you look up here, you can see it actually drops below that point and then comes back again. So it overshoots. And another one that can be quite fun to use is bounce. You can see it accelerates and then hits and bounces back and then hits and bounces back. So you could definitely use this to simulate something bouncing off the floor. And then another one of some interest is elastic mode and you can see what it's doing there. It's basically quickly gone over to here and then jiggled around as though it was perhaps a, on a piece of elastic there that's just unstretched. Again, quite interesting in itself. And evidently this affects the other axes as well. So I'll just put that back to Bezier, which I think is the most pleasing method for the majority of animations. Most things are gonna accelerate then decelerate. But as I say, there are occasions when you want some other methods. 
So that's very simple. You go to the graph editor and you then select key and interpolation in order to change the way an object moves. So we've got our sphere making a simple movement from right to left in a nice Bezier acceleration and deceleration. But what if we wanted to do something else as well? So are we now stuck? Has it, have we now set the animation from right to left? Well, no, we can add more to it. So let's look from above and let's go to frame 125. So can we now make this movement slightly more complex and have the sphere perhaps take a diversion around this cube? So in fact, let's go to frame 100. And what I'll do is I'll put the sphere there and I'll press I and I'll just say location again. And then we'll perhaps go to frame 200 and I'll perhaps put the sphere there and press I for location there. But let's go back to the beginning and let's see what that's done to our movement. So you can see it's going off in that direction. It's actually going to hit the cube because of where I put it, but it comes through there and there. So let's say I didn't want it to hit the cube. So perhaps what I need to do is add another keyframe. One little piece of advice is generally don't use any more keyframes than you need to, because the more you put in, the less smooth your movement will be. And generally you want smooth animation, not always. But if we continue here, we can see just about there, the sphere is impacting our cube. So let's go to frame 145, nice round number. Let's move our sphere to there and see what that does and keyframe that for location. And if we just go from here, we can see it now just misses it. And perhaps we want it to miss our little toroid as well on the way in at least. So just about here, call it frame 170. Let's give it another keyframe. So let's move it to here and maybe to here. That's going to affect it passing the cube because I've lowered it a little bit, but that's fine. So let's press play there. And we can see it's now nice and smoothly going through, but bear in mind, each of those is a Bezier interpolation. So there is a bit of accelerating and decelerating going on, but because they're quite close together, you don't notice it too much. And if we look from here, we can see our sphere moving nicely round behind our cube and then into our donut or toroid there. Can I control the movement of one object with another? And yes, I can. There are multiple ways that are more complex, but a very simple method is just to, for example, it's just right click my cube, then right click my sphere, control P and say set parent to object. And you notice we've got a little line there now. And if I now press play, you can see that the cube's moving along with my sphere. And there it goes. So we've recorded some very basic motion there. But what if we want to, for example, rotate something? So let's rotate this toroid. We're at the beginning of the animation and I'm going to come to the objects properties and you can see we've got rotation here. So I'm just going to hover over here and press I and you notice we get a yellow background. If I can select this sphere again, you can see we've got a yellow background over location. I'll select my object and I'm going to go to the end of the animation. Note it's now green, which is telling me there's a keyframe, but it's not on the frame that we are currently at. And I'm going to select 359 for basically rotation of my object at this frame. So now press I. If we go to the beginning and press play, you can see our little toroid there is rotating. And if I lower my ground plane a little bit, and we'll just turn off the grid floor. So you can see it just rotates once. So what if I wanted it to rotate more times than that? So go to the last keyframe. I could just put 359. I do a slightly odd number because Blender will often try to be clever and say, well, you started at naught and you ended at naught. So therefore you don't want me to interpolate anything. So I normally go slightly off the full rotation so that Blender will always interpolate. It's just a little funny of the way Blender interpolates. So I could put 359 times six to make it rotate six times. Make sure I hover over it and press I to store that keyframe. So in this case, it's 2,154 degrees. 
So I press now and you can see it's rotating many more times. And you'll also notice because it has that Bezier curve, it actually speeds up and slows down again, which I think is more pleasing to the eye. Now it doesn't just have to rotate, of course, on the one axis. If we go to the end, we could select the Z axis as well and perhaps put 2154 in there as well. Press I again, that's important, otherwise that number will disappear. And then press play. And you now see we've got a much more complicated animation. And we could, of course, do it on the Y axis too. And while we're at it, let's do that. So 2154, and of course, it can be a negative number to make it go the opposite way. 2154 and pressed I again. So it's now rotating on all three axes. And we get a much more complicated animation, as you can see, it actually stops occasionally. And you can make some more interesting effects by perhaps having a slightly different number for each of them. So I'll put 2000 for that one and 1900 for that one. So they'll be rotating at slightly different speeds, which will effectively give us something called a beat frequency between them, which makes it a much more chaotic motion or chaotic appearing motion at least. So that's rotation, but can an object that's parented to another object also rotate? Well, there's an easy way to find out. We'll select our cube here, which is a child of the sphere, the movement for which we've, of course, animated. So we're at the beginning of the animation. I'm going to press I. And this time I'm going to alter the scale. So scale can be animated pretty much anything with numbers attached to it, which is most things you can animate. You can even animate color and things like that. So I'm going to go to the beginning of the animation and I'm just going to press I over scale. Then I'm going to go to the end and I'm going to set Z to point 0.1 and press I. So let's see what that does. And you can see that this cube is now shrinking. And let's see if we can rotate it as well. So this time I'm going to make it rotate on Y. So let's go to the beginning of the animation, press I to store the initial state, go to the end, and let's just set it to something arbitrary. And press I there, back to the beginning and press play. And you can see not only is our cube shrinking in one axis, it's now rotating as well. And finally, what happens if I rotate my sphere? So we're at the beginning, I'll store the rotation, we'll go to the end and we'll put again some arbitrary number of rotations and press I to store that. Go to the beginning and press play. So now you can see We've got some quite crazy things going on. And because it's parented, the cube rotates around the sphere, which is rotating, although you can't see it because there's no facets on it. If you just look from above, we can really see what's going on there. That was short, but I hope you find it interesting, and I'll cover some more aspects of animation in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you soon. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.